Yeah, okay, you kind of caught me here. So there was a moment, and the moment was when I remember looking at him going like, Barry, I just don't care. And and it was like that self-realization. I was like, I really don't care about the, the, the root build-up. I don't care. And then I went, wow, I actually don't care. And I think I said out loud, like, I need to find a new job. And he was like, calm down, you're being dramatic. But that was the moment I knew that I wasn't interested in it. And I think that the, I think how you know if you're a true architect is like, Stephen, thank you very much to join us on the podcast. Uh, welcome to Uni8. Um, so just a brief introduction, just let us know uh, who we are and how you, what you do. Okay, wow. Um, what do I do? That's a good question. I have no <laughs> idea anymore. I'm a bit of an oddball, right? So my name's Stephen Drew, and I set up a website three years ago called The Architecture Social, uh, and that was all based on... The stuff that I've been doing in architecture and architecture recruitment there used to be a part two. It was a very naughty part two. I used to do a little bit of work, to just enough to get by. I wasn't interested in that so much. I was more interested in working with people um, on problems. And then also I was more interested in just chatting and getting up some mischief. So basically I fell into recruitment which no one ever plans to go into. Why would you ever go into recruitment, right? And I was like, you know, recruit. Yeah, that was kind of like the, the the backup plan that I didn't even know existed because mm -hmm. architecture didn't quite work out for me. But after 10 years of doing that, so all the lessons that I'd done on, in terms of uh, learning what really happens behind the closed doors in architectural recruitment, I thought it would be good to put that all out there on the architecture social so that people can hopefully learn from uh, the mistakes that I've done and also the things that I see behind the scenes that no one no one ever talks about normally in okay. the public domain. Yeah. Very interesting. We might touch some of these topics uh, later on. Um, okay, so in terms of really the beginning of uh, architecture, when this all started, uh, when do you, you want to... Did you went to uh, architecture school did you do yeah. an architecture degree i did i went i so, did that i did i've got a degree in diploma so i'm a part two you know i never mm -hmm. think i'll get qualified it'd be great if they if they shake up the university degree and diploma you know the arb wants to shake it up maybe one day i can get qualified but until then i am permanently a part two which i take <laughs> as a badge of honor um it's a really odd place, isn't it? Because they're not qualified. You do five years and you're called an architectural assistant, which basically mm -hmm. sounds like you're holding out pens and pencils for the architect when actually it takes five years of your life. So, yeah, I'm, on, I'm technically an architectural assistant, um, but I have worked in-house in an architecture practice, two of them now, as their head of talent or talent acquisition so that generally involves being part of the meetings um, looking for people to join the company and um, organizing all that stuff behind the scenes. So that, that, that is the fancy title, is head of talent. But the, the real deal is that I'm, I'm technically a part two. Yeah. Okay, and how on what started like in terms of the the passion of architecture? When did you realize you wanted to pursue architecture? Well, I thought I was going to be a doctor for a while, and then um, <laughs> for some reason it was like with drawings, and I used to do a lot of drawings, um, and and then I kind of flirted with the idea of being a doctor. Um, but I went into architecture, and and uh, I, I loved it. It was a great course, you know. I, I learned a lot. I, uh, I, you know, was doing what everyone else does, right? First year, you mm -hmm. kind of mess around, you know, you're like, you know, drinking, doing God knows what else, you know, having a little Scooby-Doo and getting <laughs> things done. And then second and third year got a bit more serious, doesn't it? And so, <laughs> you know, then, and then by, you know, diploma or part two, mm -hmm. I mean, you can only have a little bit of fun in the first year. 
And then the second, you know, the final get more serious. Yeah, it gets so super serious, doesn't it? That's right. So, <laughs> but I managed to get a two-one, which is uh, which uh, I uh, I think I think it's really hard if you get a two-one in architecture. I think you've done really well. It's such a harsh, hard course that I think uh, anyone that gets to that level has, has done all right. So you know, mm -hmm. two a third though. I think you've been partying a bit too much if you go a third sometimes. <laughs> you know, absolutely. Um, and so it's it's going to be funny to to ask you this because um, so you, you basically in terms of the uh, career you you wanted to pursue architecture was a bit like um, probably not what you you imagined on your first year as an architect or an architecture let's say um, so what was your inspirations or your goals when you were first or second student um, in architecture. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I never. It sort of sounds a bit mad, but I never, I never thought about it too far ahead. I think a lot of people do that, right? They, everyone basically goes into architecture. They think about the course that they're doing. They think about their project. They think about themselves as a designer, and you learn a lot. But I never thought about where I wanted to work after it. So when I kind of um, when I when I graduated, I basically had the like the realization that oh my god i've got to go and find work somewhere i kind of freaked out and sent my application to lots of places and um this and when i was looking for a job it was during their um the financial crisis so there wasn't many jobs around and i had a friend um who's now a famous youtuber believe it or not who doesn't do architecture um but he was um he, he gave me some good advice he was like don't apply to one or two places you should apply to like a few hundred and so i used to compete with him because i used to look up to him and he was sending out 400 applications so i sent out 400 500 600 <laughs> 700 applications and in the end i got an interview and, and i got a really good job at a company called epr architects so i was, I was really lucky um, but I had no clue to answer your question. I just kind of just kind of mm. fumbled along, and um, luckily it worked out. But um, a lot of people, I think I as well, don't really think about where they're going to work. And mm. also, the other bit I'd like to add is that I w it was such a shock going into the industry. To me, it didn't feel like anything I'd studied for before. You know, it was kind of quite scary i mean i was lucky that the people were really welcome into me but you know you study all this stuff you're thinking about your project and all this stuff and then you get in and you basically just shoved on well at the time it was microstation and now it's revit or whatever and you're part of a bigger project you're not the star mm -hmm. architect of your own project anymore you're like a tiny cog in a machine and you know nothing so you start <laughs> at the bottom and it was um it was an eye opener um, and, uh, I think that I really enjoyed my part one, but my part two is, is like, like shit was getting real and you've got to now start to do then all the technical detailing and all that stuff. And I just didn't have a passion for it. So I, um, I had to frantically think like, what the heck do I want to do with my life? And it was either become a BIM coordinator or become a recruitment consultant. And probably the, the, the smart thing would have been to be a BIM coordinator. But um, even for that, I mean, I don't know whether it would have suited me well. So I kind of fell out of architecture, fell out of love with it. And then at the time, it was like Wolf of Wall Street, the film had come out, and I'd really um, watched that, and I was getting the vibe. And I was thinking, like, let's just go for it. Let's just, just like, do something totally different, make a lot of money. And um, I did make a lot of money, but it was also crazy because you'd given up all that stuff that you studied for years, um, and you were going into a sales environment. And let me tell you something. For anyone that has seen Wolf of Wall Street, it is 50% true. It is a bit like that. Okay, you're not throwing short people at a dartboard, um, and hopefully you're not doing, like, loads of cocaine there. But some people, you know, in sales environments, of course, they're on all kinds of stimulants, whether it's a Red Bull or whatever else, right? But the, there's, there's a way to do it right and there's a way to do it wrong. And I quickly learned that even this world, though, it wasn't that easy and it was still hard work in a very different way. And actually, it was all about your ethics and 
and your longevity and longevity in an AM profession. And so, yeah, you could totally make loads of money and be a bit of a um, bit of a bastard. Excuse my language. You probably have to edit that bit out. <laughs> but you know, and you would make more money. But then, would you would you have a good reputation in the industry? Probably not. So there there was there was there's something interesting there. And I guess what I um, um, appreciate is that by falling into recruitment, right? When you're an architect, we talked about all this stuff. Like um, I constantly see people talk about alternative careers, yeah. And the reality is, we're so like if I was joking earlier about a two, two, and and a third, and partying. But the reality is, if you've got a degree, a diploma in architecture, that skill set is really good elsewhere. You know, it's no mistake that my my friend who also got a 2-1 or whatever and was really good at model making is now has um, a YouTube channel with over a million subs and makes, you know, uh, 80,000, 90,000, probably. Don't know. Never told me. But if you look at the social analytics, it's like we well, must be making nearly 100 grand. And all the stuff he learned in it was all the skill set in architecture. OK, mm -hmm. I'm a chatty person, but the I chat about all the stuff that I learned in the industry. And that's why I've gone on to do really well in this. And the last thing I'd say, Pedro, before I open it up and, you know, you can ask me anything else is that I have another friend who did part one, didn't do his part two, but he went on to um, coding in another environment, in another industry. So he's like the front end UI designer working on Lloyd's Bank, working on like Halifax, all these apps, you know, like when you do internet banking. And where he learned all his skills was in architecture. Mm -hmm. And they love him because he's a programmer, but he can think spatially. And that comes from architecture school. So actually, um, it, what I find extremely fascinating about architects is that the, the skill set that they do is extremely valuable, especially if they're very daring to go into other industries. But it's also very scary, isn't it, to kind of go away from the status quo, part one, part two, part three. I mean, when I went deviated from doing my part three, people look at you like you're an absolute idiot. And it's like, oh my God, boy, if you're not want to do your part three, are you crazy? Are you a loser? Are you stupid? Oh my God, what is Steve thinking? But then ironically, when you start making it, people go, oh yeah, that's great. Look at you. Well done. And um, it's quite an interesting learning curve. But so yes, I did. Um, I did still I, there's something special about architecture and, and I, i'm very grateful because it's where i am it's where mm -hmm. it got me today but equally you know it's it's not the necessary architecture like i'm not as afraid of um you know not designing the building i don't care if i don't design another building for my other life but actually the way i look at how i build projects is exactly the same way i look at uh, my own business now so uh you know, for anyone listening who's thinking, like, I'm not too sure I should do it, and why do you have to get qualified? I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to kind of look at different careers. No, absolutely. And um, before we record the podcast, uh, we talked earlier about, uh, especially the part, part ones, where it's kind of uh, finding out your skills yeah. or what you really want to pursue architecture or not. And uh, I had kind of um, a few friends, a few colleagues from part one where they they just didn't follow part two and some went for um, cinema industry, others yeah. for illustration. Um, and as you said, it's fascinating the part, the architecture itself, where it gives you so many open doors or so many other um, opportunities to see yourself or the skills you can develop um, just studying architecture. Um, yeah. And so, in, as you just jump in as a to become an architect, let's say, and uh, and pursue recruitment, while you were doing your, um, let's say, architectural assistant on this uh, practice, yeah. what was the things that was more annoying you or make you realize that okay, this is not what I want, and then perhaps um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try re uh, recruitment. <laughs> yeah okay you kind of caught me here so there was a moment and the moment was uh i had my manager at the time who was a friend of mine so there was the big manager and then there was the, an architect or part two at the same time as me and he was going up and i was kind of going like along you know <laughs> and um 
his name was Barry, and I get along with Barry. Uh, Barry's a, a great architect, Barry Higgins. And Barry asked me to do like a task on like a roof build up or some drainage or something. And I, and uh, he's like, come on, you need to, you know, start thinking about what you're doing and pay attention and maybe you'll, you'll work it out. And I remember looking at him going like, Barry, I just don't care. And and it was like that self-realization. I was like, I really don't care about the, the, the roof build up. I don't care. And then I went, wow, I actually don't care. And I think I said out loud, like, I need to find a new job. And he was like, calm down, you're being dramatic. But that was the moment I knew that I wasn't interested in it. And I think that the, I think how you know if you're a true architect is like, okay, yeah, this is a profession that you can do a lot of hours on. And um, we all have to regulate that a bit. Um, But Ultimately, you're doing it because there's a passion there, surely, because it's not the most high-paid profession to do architecture. I mean, if you want to make loads of money, you should, you're in the wrong job. You should be like um, doing stockbrokering or whatever, or the tech company, or like we talked about, switch from architecture to something else, and you'll probably make a lot more money. But you know, if you've got that bug, if you've got that desire to build, if you've got that desire to to build hospitals, to make a big difference in the urban fabric, to build schools, to change people's lives, make amazing housing, affordable housing, you know, that can um, help a lot of people who are in lower socioeconomic backgrounds. If suddenly they have this beautiful house because you've designed it, then, you, you know, it's like a doctor. You get to make a massive difference in these people's lives. And, um, And if your brain is geared to solving that problem and making that beautiful house or making that beautiful, I don't know, whatever, memorial, museum, then great, it's the job for you. And you kind of know deep down if you like it. And I didn't have that. And that's when I was like, you know, I'm not, I should be doing something else. And what I've learned now is that while I do recruitment, actually, what I find really interesting is it's the problem about how to get jobs in the industry. And actually, there's a big challenge there because no one's really advanced recruitment for the last 20 to 30 years, especially in the architecture sector. So for me, where I get my kicks at is like looking at the brief, if you would call it, of that of okay, how do I optimize people looking for jobs in architecture and how can I help architecture practices find the people that would suit them in their company? And so that's what I get my kicks out of it now. But, you know, I I didn't know that 10 years ago. I kind of fell into it Mm -hmm. and um, I felt like there was a big opportunity there. So that's where I'm going with this is that even though I I, uh, bizarrely, running my own business now, I've probably spent way more hours than I did uh, I, when I'm talking about when I was a part two and I was fed up of the, the roof buildups. But in this world, I don't look at the clock. Whereas in that world, when I was in the practice, I was just like, I don't want to be here. And I think like what you've got to, what I, my advice would be to anyone that's in that situation is there's two things, right? If you find yourself in architecture and you're not too sure if it's for you, it could be the office environment that you're in. It genuinely could. It could be the kind of projects you're working on. And so there's a, there's a little bit of that, of looking at the environment you're in. But I think more than that, you have to look like deep down in your soul and you need to say, you need to have some, you need to interrogate yourself and you need to hold what I call yourself. Yeah. You need to really like examine it and you need to, you need to be truthful. And, and the bit that I always call it is you gotta, you gotta hold up the ugly mirror and no one likes looking in the ugly mirror because it's very hard to look and be so brutally honest to yourself. But if you can um, have that conversation, I think it's really important that when I held up the ugly mirror and I said, Steve, look at you, what are you doing? Do you want to be an architect? I said, no, I don't want to do it. And I think that we have to be really honest with ourselves because actually in the long run, when we only live once, it's better to do it. And it's always better to do it earlier in your career than later in your career. Yeah. Absolutely. And so this question is, what type of recruiter you are? And I'll give you an example. 
So uh, mm. obviously, we've been based on LinkedIn. Um, I, I kind of been approached with some recruiters uh, specialized yeah. in architecture, and um, with apologies for all the recruiters in architecture, but I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the reason I'm saying this, uh, obviously, it's not personal. There are professionals that are different uh, the way they do it. But yeah. I had bad experience with the uh, with the recruiters, and that's what gave me the impression of them. Yeah, of course. And the reason the reason I'm saying this is. Um, I, I, I never really approached a, a recruiter to find a job. I normally find myself um, a job offer and I apply for it. Great. Um, and so when there's like, this communication between me and the recruiter is basically on LinkedIn when they approach me. And it's basically yeah. a copy and paste message, which is yeah. okay. And then they ask me for like a CV portfolio. I send to them. Uh, and normally they ask me my phone number as well with, to, to call me and speak on the phone. Uh, there's also one thing... I kind of don't really like is when, and I believe is like privacy uh, purpose and stuff. When they okay, there's this company that they they say that like it's a competitive salary, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't give me any details about who's the, what's the yeah. company, what's the well, the role. Normally they say it, but and so which is fine. I, again, I don't understand the recruitment part of it, and so that's good to have you to 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 understand that. Yeah. Um, and so normally when this this uh, first call to, to talk about the skills, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you never heard back from them, which is they probably contact like a thousand um, applicants or, or uh, people. I don't know. But is, yeah. is that their break? Like they approach you quite nicely. How are you? Blah, blah, blah. But then, OK, they say, I don't need any more. I got uh, the person I need. So mm. just help me over here and maybe help another recruiter to give a better image of themselves. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, I mean, I think that's a fair account that you've had. And listen, I've made a lot of mistakes in the past and I'm always learning myself. I think right mm -hmm. now, the problem I have is that I'm time poor and, and that's why I've hired people to help me now. So yeah, it's not just me because I think sometimes when I'm too busy, I forget to message people, and that's mm -hmm. a bit of a shame because then obviously that person's kind of waiting for a reply. So that's something I'm working on, and I'm still working on it. Um, but that uh, you touched upon a few key things, and I think the one important thing is honesty, integrity, and all that stuff. Now, there is technically not much regulatory anything in recruitment and unfortunately what that means is that you've got it's a complete wild west it's a complete wild west and especially pedro when people are not coming into uh, architecture recruitment from an architecture background they don't give a shit you know they just want to get you in the job get paid because also the other thing about recruitment is that when a recruitment get consultant gets paid is at the end right so yeah if, if they don't think you're going to be right for the job you're kind of gone it's a bit it's a bit cruel it reminds me of tinder you know it's like oh i'll just i'll just swipe and like uh, tell everyone i like them i want to pair with everyone and then say now me and this other person pair you know and they go hey steve how's it going and then i see their picture pop up and i'm like oh i don't fancy you anymore and you ignore them and that's a little bit what happens in recruitment unfortunately and um it's really unfair for that person <laughs> who's who swiped you know to the right you both swipe to the right and then you get ignored again so and that's what i talked about earlier there's a lot of opportunity in the space to kind of optimize it. And I agree with you. So I think that there's a challenge around like making recruitment more ethical. I think that's a very fair point that you raise. And I think that's an ongoing challenge. Um, the, the bit that I would say is that because I've done it for 10 years, it's a bit like, so, you know, you run your own practice. It's very hard to build up a good reputation. It's very quick to destroy it. And mm -hmm. I think that um, honesty is the best policy. Although sometimes in recruitment, being honest doesn't necessarily make the recruitment consultant more money, which again is another reason why you get unethical practices in architectural recruitment. So i tell you a really, really quick example is that an architecture practice will take the person's CV, 
from the first recruitment consultant that sends it over. And what that means then is there's a rush for recruitment consultants to speak to someone and try and convince that person to send that CV over as soon as possible. And sometimes the recruitment consultancy will do it without the permission of the candidate, which is illegal. They shouldn't do that, but they do it because they want to bend the rules. They want to get the money. So the whole system is kind of needs to be fixed because surely the recruitment consultant, which doesn't pressurize you, the recruitment consultant, which meets you, understands your career, that should be the one that gets rewarded by the companies, not the recruitment consultant, which sends your CV without the, your permission, you know. So um, I think, though, that 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 is changing. And I think mm -hmm. even like us talking about it, though, um, helps to point the issue out. I guess my advice would be to like your, yourself or anyone is that when you um, pick a recruitment consultant to speak to, you should really do the, your due diligence on them. You know, have a look at their profile. Like, do they really know what they're talking about? It. How long have they been in architectural recruitment before? Okay, maybe they got they're at the start. You know, and you can you can suss that out. But have a look at if they've got any reviews. Have a look if they've got any recommendations. And remember, they can be faked a little bit as well. So that's a good sign. But you've kind of got to keep doing more due diligence. Have a look at the website. Have a look at the brand. And I would recommend that you don't speak to too many recruiters. You want to pick one or two that you really think is aligned with your core values and then use them. It's exactly like picking an architect for a property. You wouldn't pick four architects, would you? You'd pick one. Uh, or you, maybe you'd see one or two at the start and then you decide who you want to go with. It's exactly the same. So I would say don't feel like you need to message everyone and also do your due diligence on them and try and have an honest conversation on a bit like uh, if, say, now you were hiring an architect, you want to interview that that recruiter a bit, you know, and ask them a few questions. And if they seem all you uh, standoffish then you think well screw you you're you know you're being an ass to me i don't need to use you and i think there's a bit of that and i i think that's generally good advice so pick who you want to work with because you're right there is no code of conduct so you need to be the judge and um judicator and decide who you think deserves your time yeah no, I agree. And one thing I was going to mention is about uh, one thing you, you you mentioned as well is um, the activity, especially the, the activity you have on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and is what makes me more like, I say, close to that person or like familiar to that person. And yeah. one thing um, I quite enjoy is especially on your profile or or even when you, um, to be fair, I don't know the, la the first time I saw your profile. I think you just pop up on my feet. And oh. I think I should start following you or something. I don't remember actually. It's just oh. um, the last time I remember you were already we were already connected. And the good thing I I I like is uh, I mean coming from the recruiter is not just uh, content related to jobs, but is yeah. the, the the part of topics of the industry when you ask about AI or or beam to to architects or or people in the industry, let's say. And I don't know if it's because you have a, an architectural background, uh, but I kind of like uh, that link, that, that, yeah, that relationship of architect for architects, basically. So, which is quite, could, could be another tip for other recruiters in the industry that have an architectural background, maybe be more engaged with architects or um, uh, with more architectural topics about it. Mm. Um, no, I completely agree. And um, architectural social that comes along. And yeah. uh, what would you say is what is our architectural social? Good question. So, I mean, the during the pandemic, I mean, that's where all this started was a forum. You know, it mm -hmm. was a forum on the architectural social. And then I was building up that community. And, and basically, I was trying to help part ones and part twos get jobs, try to give advice. And all that advice is still there. And that was my logic because if someone rings me up, I can give them a little bit of advice, but the truth is in recruitment, you only have a little bit of time on the phone. You kind of have to, you have to choose. You have to be very careful about where you spend your time. So why not build this big resource of information that if a part one gets in touch, but I don't have a part one role 
that I'm working on. You give them a lot of information. And then you build up this directory and all this stuff. So it's kind of changed since then. You can check the architecturesocial.com. I'd say that the the live streams on LinkedIn, it's quite a powerful way to get out there. And I think that everyone can reverse engineer the stuff that I do and apply it to their career. You know, there's a few good examples. You know, yourself, you're doing a podcast, Pedro, which is great. Tom Roundtree's big. He's got his YouTube channel. Hamza Sheikh is kind of... Does a, he had a podcast before and he does a lot of stuff online, Sana to Bastard and Scale. And all these people basically creating noise in the space online and building up networks. And that's really, really powerful. So going back to your point, so the architecture social, whenever I put content out there, it kind of goes back to this website. And it builds and builds and builds and builds. And that's the that's the beauty of a brand personal brand or a business brand is that it takes a lot of time and and energy and constant rigor to build up and and what i like to think of the arctic social is that place where all the content exists and so i'll be very honest with you pedro the 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 community has gone much more quiet um since the pandemic i think during the pandemic it was bouncing you know it's like 300 people a day and everyone was talking and then after the pandemic Got to be quieter and be quieter. And um, so it's still there. The forum's still there. And I'm going to look at it again. I have to cast my design eyes and think, okay, how am I going to change it? But at the same time, that's okay because the, 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 the live streams and stuff have got more popular. And I think that's the other thing. It's a bit like a building or whatever where the users will do different behaviors over time. And so what Mm -hmm. I'm seeing is that there's a higher engagement with the podcast. There's a higher engagement with the live streams, the the YouTube live streams, LinkedIn live streams, and getting content out there in different ways. So the next um, thing that I'm looking at is building up this online directory. And it's there's one that came out recently, and someone was saying to me, oh, my God, there's another architecture directory that's come out. And that's true. Uh, but I think the directory that I'm interested in is like, how do you, as a job seeker, find where you want to work? And it's not even about recruitment consultants anymore because you are you mentioned earlier that you found every job direct. Well, my challenge there would be like, how can someone go in the architecture social, find out about a company they never heard of, and then send an application and they get a job there? Because... We're, we're, we all kind of know the big names, Gensler, mm-hmm. Grimshaw, Heatherwick, Wilkinson Air, um, good companies, all good companies. But these are the names that we know, Fosters and Partners, right, famous, big company, okay? But then what about the smaller practice that you might not have heard of, which is really cool, and they're down the road, and, and they're actually very good at, like, um, diversity, inclusivity, flexible hours, different types of projects. So that's what I'm interested in is like, how can we shift that focus? So if anyone wants to check out the architecture social and critique it or offer any suggestions, then please do. It's there for people to have a look at. Yeah. Actually, can I give you a suggestion? I'm not sure Mm. uh, if this uh, already happened and you're on your uh, website or maybe not, but while you were talking, something came to my mind in terms do the opposite of the recruitment, where normally there's a comp, there's a architectural co- uh, practice, and 700 applicants send them the CVs and portfolios. Yeah. But what about if it was a platform where the these applicants were visible? They were yeah. they have their profiles on architectural social with your with our CVs with our portfolios, and whenever a company wanted to to find a part one or part two, they just go to architectural social. Right, let me see this person. Let me see John. Let me see Mariana. Yeah. Um, they open the, the their profile. They see the CV. They see the portfolio. But perhaps there is a status or looking for a job or already employed. I don't know. And uh, okay, let's contact this person. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, do you have that already? 
Yeah, I thought about it a lot, and okay. uh, you, and you're right. No, 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 but you're right. It's something that is on is on the list, and um, it's good you're thinking that. And uh, see, your architectural brain in this scenario is kind of uh, it makes sense what you're saying. There's a few challenges which we'll get there, but there's a few things like how, for example, do I protect you, Pedro? See now where you are, whatever company you are. If you say you're open to an opportunity. I have to be very careful for um, not betraying your trust, right? And if it just went online and then your current company was using the platform. So there's a few things I need to kind of safeguard. Mm -hmm. But once I crack them, you're right, we can do it. <laughs> or maybe maybe you, there's two options. It's like, yes, I'm open to opportunities. Because on LinkedIn, you can do that, can't you? Where you say, mm -hmm. beep. I'm open, and then the million recruiters message you or whatever. But yeah, you're right. Wouldn't it be cool if that went out to all the architecture practices? But how do you make sure that your your current um, employer doesn't see it? Because years ago, you will laugh. I have a friend who's actually quite a successful architect now, but he sent his application to 200 architecture practices. He used the list he 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 he, he applied, uh, used to send applications from a year or two ago, but he forgot to remove his current company. So he sent mm -hmm. his current CV to his own boss, and he got sacked. <laughs> I see. So, I see. So so um, once I solve them, we can do it. But but you're right; it doesn't feel like there's a particular space for me. Uh, it, I think the closest one, the closest example I've seen is Archinect in the US. And, you know, I admire what they do, and they've got a big job board in a forum. But it's not quite the same mm -hmm. as what I'm looking at. And, you know, there's another platform called Test Layout, which tries to solve the formula. Um, I'm not too sure that's working. I'm not too sure. I have to be careful what I say. I'm going to get get in trouble. But if it is, brilliant. But what I mean is I don't really see him making much ripples yet. So there's there's something to do. There's something in this space. And hey, I welcome everyone trying to solve the problem because it's a collaborative effort. But no one's quite done it yet. So so maybe maybe the social is the first one. But we'll see. You never know. Okay, no, very very interesting. I'll I'll be there to to see where this can can go. And um, so I'll probably a lot of people ask you this uh, this question. Uh, and I know you've done a video before about portfolios and maybe CVs. And so it, just not repeating maybe your words, but um, something really quick, what would you say uh, to the people who are listening? Um, what will be your, your key, key advice for portfolios or CVs to be really highlighted uh, when someone is recruiting? Okay, well, there's, they're so personalized. There's a few general things that you can, you can stick to. I think if in doubt, you know, white background is probably a really sensible thing. You should probably have one to two sheets on your CV and a portfolio will be between five to 15 sheets because you can take the big portfolio when you go to um, a interview. You'll probably want to make sure that that portfolio is under 10 megabytes because emails restrict the sizes. And you always want to put your most recent work at the front you know, and your part one stuff, if it makes it to your CV, then okay, but it should be at the back. But you want you want the CV and the portfolio especially to be all killer, no filler, nice, easy font. You want all the dates of when you've worked somewhere, you want to clear, you want to put, you want to put references on if you can. Um, we can go into that in more detail, but those are just some really quick facts. You know, think about like spelling, that can really upset some people. I used to work with a recruitment consultant that if you had spellings, he would ignore your CV. I'm not that bad. I don't mind them, but you know, it can really like interrupt um, uh, the the person who's reading it's attention. So there's a quote, I think uh, Chris Castle, who's uh, the managing director at EPR, he pretty much summarized it when he said that actually, if you think about it, you're an architect, you're a designer, your CV and portfolio should be the most important documents that you ever do. Uh, it really is that simple because you, you're basically trying to get an interview. And and, mm -hmm. and the first step to get in an interview is your CV and portfolio. So it's got to communicate all the skill sets you have quite efficiently. And it's got to stand out as well. 
And when I say stand out, I don't mean like a crazy color or whatever. I mean, it's going to be this beautiful document. And you want to kind of speak the language of the place that you're applying for. Have a look at their graphic design. Have a look at their style. Have a look at their ethos. For example, if they were a residential practice you're applying for and you put on the residential scheme, probably worth putting that higher up in your CV and portfolio so that that company sees it equally if you're a student. You don't need to worry about that too much. But, you know, you might want to emphasize your ability on Revit if they use Revit in the practice. So there's, there's a few things that you can do to kind of get the, 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 the CV and portfolio to stand out. Also, I think it's really important to accurately explain your situation. If you require a visa, that's fine, but you need to say it because you're going to waste your time. You're going to waste everyone's time if they're not in the position to sponsor it. You know, most people kind of hide that because they worry, they worry about it, but you should you should bring it to the front. You don't want to waste your time. And mm -hmm. there's other things as well. Like um, I do think covering letters are a really good, um, I think they are not essential. The amount of times I've seen covering letters stop people getting jobs rather than getting jobs is very interesting. And I think covering letters are a good candidate um for replacing or writing with chat gpt like i don't think you need a cover in there <laughs> you know you could get, that's the perfect thing to get ai to do because the amount of dribble is written in those things is um hilarious like no one cares about uh the amount of your interest in sustainability okay but we all write this crappy cover and letter because we think it's the right thing to do and then even worse is when you spent a half a day customizing it for an architecture practice and they might not even open it i'm, I'm much rather if people's concentrated their energy on that cv and portfolio and you know didn't even do a cover and letter the amount of people i speak to still love that cover and letter and i always say great okay if you really want to do it do it but in terms of the 12 years of done recruitment you don't need that cover and letter you just need the cv and portfolio don't waste your time. Don't do it. That's interesting uh, you saying that. Uh, recently, um, I worked for a small company uh, in architecture, and uh, they, they were recruiting, and I helped them with that. And um, it's interesting you say the cover letter, because on the on the description of the job offer, we said, instead of, uh, when, when you say about, like, uh, annex your, your TV, your portfolio, etc., uh, we put about, uh, instead of sending us a cover letter or writing a cover letter, just tell us uh, what's architecture for you and how you see yourself in five years. And mm. what helped us in a way was uh, how many people read the, the description and yeah. instead of like copy and paste the copy letter. And, um, and for those who send a copy letter, we were really just specific to see the keywords of, for example, we were looking at someone with BIM knowledge, building regulations and store, uh, software skills, etc. And there were the keys. We, we didn't read the COVID letter at all, which is um, looking for these keys, okay, and moving on, or this person might be interesting or not. And um, it touches as well the point of AI. And mm. uh, it'll be interesting from, from you as an architect background and a recruiter currently uh, to this might be a challenge question, I don't know, but how do you see this, this coming years or what is happening from uh, what the, the, the companies are looking for in terms of, because now we have AI um, like a lot in terms of like chat GPT, uh, mid journey, etc. So, um, and I guess now as well, the AI is merging with, I say, the grasshopper in Rhino. So how do you see basically this AI uh, affecting the architectural industry or what the, the, the architectural companies are looking for? Yeah, I think that it won't change much. I think it's another tool that gets to mm. be used. I think like a good example was covering letters, like amazing, okay, we can get rid of that. But AI is pretty much... Like, I don't think that CVs are going to have lots of mid-journey images and people are going to be, and people are going to go, hey, here's my project. And then I don't think people are going to be like, oh, yeah, this this is their project. I mean, you can kind of feel a mid-journey image or like um, Hamza had a good um, exhibition the other day where he blurred AI with old school techniques. And I think that's like a really good response to it, but it's still requires time because mid journey mm -hmm. is like brilliant at conveying a mood or generating this stuff but 
as you know, to present a project, it's going to be, it's going to, when you go into an interview, it's going to be interrogated. People are going to say like, how, how did you do this? How did you do that? What's this? What's that? What did you look at? And you just can't do that from AI. But then equally, AI is such a great way to do repetitive tasks over and over and over and over. And I think that's where it's really good. So, you know, I use AI a lot. I, I want to do it way more. I use it for, you, you'll you laugh at this, I do it for my podcast descriptions, everything, because I'm just like, you know, do, 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 get it out. Because, I mean, why do I want to write podcast descriptions all the time? They're just the pain in the ass to do. So if I can <laughs> get the robot to do it, then amazing. And then I can concentrate and have conversations in the recording of podcasts. And I think that that's the way to look at AI. And I don't, I haven't heard much practices using it at the moment because it, there's, there's most companies still, you know, there's big projects in BIM and stuff, but I do see, um, like as a few tech companies called there's one called cope and that's all to do with program scripts that plug into revit so there is a place for innovation but there's specific companies which are more likely going to be looking at these tools as a way to change projects you know i don't think people are using chat gpt in their door schedules yet mm -hmm. i don't see it happening um and but mid-journey i do see some architects using it like a bit like a mood board or a, or an alternative to pinterest like before you'd go on pinterest or you kind of get a few images and get a vibe and you can generate that on mid-journey so do you, so to summarize and finalize your question do i see it radically changing the industry Slowly, I see it becoming a tool that people use more, but I don't see it replacing architects anytime soon. That's good to know. <laughs> um, and so to finalize uh, the last question and uh, coming from architecture, being a current recruiter, how do you see yourself in five, 10 years time? Well, I hope I'm not doing as much recruitment anymore. You know, there's, it's like anything else. I, I think it's important to always keep doing going back to the roots so it's like mm -hmm. you know when you're a part one you you do a lot of the repetitive tasks and then the favor on in your career you're, you're managing teams and that's the way i'd like to be involved i'd like to be building the architecture social doing different challenges less like a soldier on on the ground in the wall and you know i'm um, trying to work with some continued great companies i mean that's one of the best things about my job is that i while i don't practice architecture i get to work with all these amazing companies that when i was studying you know i only wished that i could work for and and i think that i would like to spend uh, time building the biggest most engaged platform and I think that we, we, we will see how far I get in five years. But like, if you think about the architecture social, there's a lot of things we could do in that space. It could be an award ceremony. There could be an event. I just told you I was in one of the big events and it was fine. However, I don't think there's one geared properly towards architects at the moment. You know, there's, I do think a lot of the big events out there are multidisciplinary and that's fine. You know, it's no problem. But I think there's a lot of innovation there. And um, I like disrupting spaces. So I think that we can disrupt recruitment. And another thing that you mentioned earlier was how unethical some recruiters can be. Maybe there's a way or a framework of there being a quality or a standard that recruiters have to adhere to, adhere to, to get a badge or a recommendation so maybe there's something that I can do in that space to make it better for everyone um, by essentially bringing the standards up. So who knows? But that's the kind of things I'd like to do. And if I can do that, then I've succeeded. And if not, then it's a good story down the pub to tell someone <laughs> how I failed. No, no, no. Fingers crossed. <laughs> mm. um, Stephen, I just want to thank you for your time. 
And for those who are listening, uh, I'll leave the, all the links of social from Stephen uh, down below. And um, we'll speak with you soon. Thank you very Thank much, you Stephen. Thank you so much for having me. Cheers. Take care. Thank you.